What is up, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Valley coming at you with another NBA team. Look ahead. We are on to the Cleveland Cavaliers, and you know what that means. I had to span the inbox of Justin Rowan from the Chase Down podcast, one of our favorite podcasts <laughs> of this, this particular show. He and Carter Rodriguez do a great job over there. Follow him on Twitter at Cavzanada. That's at C A V S A N A D A. Or you can see it on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, Justin, I have many questions to ask you, but the most, in, which is surprising because we only spoke like a couple months ago <laughs> on this podcast. Uh, but the most important question I'll ask is how the hell are you? I'm doing well, man. This is, uh, about the most excited I've ever been going into a cast season. I'm, I'm flattered by the intro. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm flattered to learn that your po sentient podcast is a big fan of the chase down podcast. I, I mean, I would thank you for the compliment, but you, you said it was the podcast itself. That's a big fan of our pod, but, uh, it's great to be back with you, man. It's, it's always a good time, uh, to be talking. And like I said, this is as excited as I've been going into a calf season. And, uh, the, the more I get to talk about it, the more excited I get. So let's get into this. Yeah. Look, let's just talk about right off the bat. The most important move they got, how will net though in free agency yeah. and, but look, I'm obsessed with the Cavs too. There's like the Pelicans. I was that was my Western Conference team where it's okay. I'm gonna be like maybe seven to eight wins higher on them than anybody else, and I'm probably not gonna be like that with the Cavs just because I think everyone realizes they're so fucking good. But like this, I'm just looking at this team and I'm like, they might be spectacular. And so we'll start with the Mitchell trade, which was the actually mm -hmm. like, how shocked this is just like independent of the fit. Just how shocked were you that? Mitchell went to the Cavs after all this talk it seemed like the Knicks were just negotiating with the Jazz and that was it the Cavs the Wizards and I think the Hornets were like tangentially mentioned at some point but mm -hmm. then it was oh the Cavs pulled out when the offer got too high or whatever it was. the asking price got too high and all of a sudden Donovan Mitchell it goes from oh he's going to New York to no oh he's a Cav I, I mean I was stunned I, I was stunned for a variety of reasons um, I think we had talked about it in the past where we were talking about what Colin Sexton can bring to the table and like similarity of numbers between he and Mitchell. And the, the question always is like, you only have this one chance really to make the consolidation trade where you're trading all of your future picks. And did the Cavs feel like Donovan Mitchell was that player that's worth putting all the chips into the middle of the table for they, they didn't feel that was the case for DeJounte Murray. And, you know, the glaring hole on this roster has kind of been the small four position and, and continues to this day. Um, but one of the things in kind of digesting this trade after the fact and something I was reflecting on was the previous summer I was on the other side of the argument where people were saying, hey, Jared Allen, you know, you're paying him all this money, but you could probably get like 80, 85 percent of Jared Allen for a little bit cheaper. But the reality of NBA team building is that extra 15 percent, that extra 20 percent really, really matters. And especially when you're talking about stacking those players uh, on top of one another, where uh, you have basically four all stars now uh, that fit really well together. There's not a lot of kind of concerns uh, on kind of what the hierarchy is going to be or anything like that. That extra little bit is the hardest thing to get in the NBA. And Donovan Mitchell, uh, from a fit standpoint, is really, really exciting. And, and uh, the, the more time that I, I've kind of thought about it, when you you reflect on the depth that the Cavs still have, even at this time, the fact that they're going to have cap space going into next offseason, like th there's so many ways for this to work out. And, and it, it's a really exciting place to be in. I will say you had DM'd me uh, shortly after the trade, which but if you ever DM me and say, oh, I listened to this, what you said about the Cavs. One, I'm always very humbled that someone like you is like, oh, I choppered in for this Cavs thing. Um, but two, <laughs> this time around, you point, we didn't even get into the like, the, we were so shell shocked when it happened in the moment. They're going to have cap space this, mm -hmm. if they want to. That is just absolutely positively wild and terrifying. Well, first of all, I would like to say I, I listen not only when it's Cavs because I, I and this is a Hardwood Knox endorsement. I like to round out my NBA landscape because I'm so hyper focused on the Cavs. And, and I think as an NBA fan, even if you are just a fan of a team, I know it's now in vogue for some people to be fans of players, and etc. But I, I think you have more of an appreciation of what your team is doing when you understand just how good the rest of the league is. And you do such a great job covering the league, bringing in experts from all those other teams. 
Um, but you're right. Like the Cavs are going to have at, uh, cap space. They're going to have a little less now. And, and I think this is really interesting because they extended Dean Wade. And to me, uh, of course, like you can't read too, too much into this. Like even the going into the off season where LeBron James came back, they didn't have the cap space for LeBron and they made the maneuvers to, to open yeah. up that cap space. But extending Dean Wade on what looks to be a really reasonable extension for someone that that's, you know, might a very highway sol- robbery. If we skip uh, ahead like 18 months, it might be highway robbery. <laughs> yeah. He's a very, very solid rotation player. And when you look at where the cap spike is going, like I feel really good about that, but it, to me, it kind of signals that they feel pretty good about their internal options, that there, there's enough guys that are going to be competitive to fit alongside that core for that. Maybe we're not going to be looking in the $20 million tier when we're looking at free agents. Maybe we're going to be looking at bringing in a backup wing rather than someone like a Harrison Barnes. Now, there's always going to be the possibility that the season shows that they are wrong in their assessment. If that is in fact their assessment, or uh, maybe they, they just feel, Hey, someone like that would really put us over the top and, and they make maneuvers to open up some space. But I, I do think it, it's at least noteworthy that they committed that money. I think, and I, this one didn't seem like it was a widespread criticism of the trade, but when people looked at it, they looked at the opportunity cost, kind of looked at where the calves were on the, you know, the buzzwordy timeline. <laughs> and we're wondering if this was the the right time to make that move. And that was the talk when they uh, went after Karis LeVert at the trade deadline, too. What yeah. did you how do you sort of reconcile the opportunity cost with where the Cavs, you know, hashtag timeline is at? I, that it's a really interesting question, because I, I think you can look at this both ways, right? Like it, it can cut both ways where sometimes you because no timelines guaranteed you might make a win now move and it costs you uh some internal upside and and there's real kind of opportunity costs i think even looking back at uh the oklahoma city thunder with the harden trade right like i i think maybe that that's an example where hey we're we're trying to balance different motivations money and uh kendrick perkins addresses a need that we have at center right uh, because we we backed out the tyson chandler trade so there's that side of it and then there's the other side where i i think you can maybe go too long kind of banking that your window is going to be open forever. And reality is like, even look at the Boston Celtics, the way things fall apart, like nothing's guaranteed. So from my perspective, adding someone like Donovan Mitchell, who, you know, just turned 26 years old, you got at least three guaranteed years on that contract with him, with the Cavs. I think it's helpful to bring someone like that in because when you have three players in their formative years, Garland, Mobley and Allen, Having bringing in a star and having them all kind of develop together, I think that is a really interesting environment. It's different than letting those guys develop their games individually and then trying to bring in a star and make that adjustment. They're kind of adjusting as they go and as they round their games out. And um, I, I think it's a really natural fit when you consider Jared Allen, obviously kind of the prototypical uh, rolling center. Uh, he, he just kind of fits well with almost anybody. Evan Mobley, you, he does all the little things. He's a glue guy. I, I think now that you have a little more talent around him, it almost allows him to be like a little more Boston Kevin Garnett than Minnesota Kevin Garnett, where he's asked to do absolutely everything. And then mm-hmm. Garland and Mitchell, they're both such talented on and off ball players that it really feels like they can kind of accentuate one another's strengths. And I, I think that's what the Cavs are really banking on. And I will say the only thing I would add is you you mentioned the windows, which is just like in the NBA, they are so fleeting now. The, the yeah. Warriors were an anomaly to begin with, but to have a team that had a long window, it shuts for a second, they're able to reopen it. Like that just doesn't happen anymore. We're like, look at Brooklyn. Like that with James, <laughs> the James Harden era specifically, like how quickly example. that yeah, came yeah. and went. So, and the other thing I will say and our listeners, this might sound like a broken record because we just wrapped up the Timberwolves look ahead. I am all for the non-flagship markets going for it. Caps lock it. And I'm not saying everyone needs to be championship or bust. This isn't a champion. Rudy Gobert was more championship or bust for the Wolves than Mitchell was for the Cavs when you just look at the age of everyone involved. Um, mm-hmm. But you want these teams to believe that they have a shot to compete with the traditional big wigs and so i want to see minnesota go after Gobert. i want to see the Cavs be aggressive against Mitchell. i want to see atlanta think that you know what we can pay this for dejounte murray and be really good and contend and so i think it's a great thing for the nba that in one summer three of these like non-flagship market team i don't want to say markets because they're all 
good sports markets in yeah. their own right. But, but I, I think people know what you're, you mean, right? Like, I, I think it's a signal of a healthy NBA ecosystem, right? Like, the, these teams feel confident that they, they can go forward and do this. And I, I think from an outside-looking-in standpoint, like, a lot of people, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even blame them, right? Like, it, Cavs don't, or Cleveland doesn't have a track record of being a good team outside of LeBron. I think a lot of people kind of view Donovan Mitchell coming in to be the guy where you look at a lot of his comments and it seems like he values what the Cavs already had and he wants to be a part of it. I think even the signal of like him going to Darius Garland's camp in Nashville, like he's coming to be a part of something. He's talking about, hey, there's so much offensive talent around me now. I can commit to defense again. Like I, I want to round out my game. I want to be a part of this. Like this isn't my show. This isn't my ship. And I really think that the Donovan Mitchell trade is more than anything, an endorsement of Co from Kobe Altman that Garland Mobley and Allen is really special. We, we believe in this core and we believe in it so much. We're going to put our, our chips to the middle of the table and trade for someone like Donovan Mitchell to help elevate this. The Donovan Mitchell fit on offense specifically with Darius Garland, but in the larger context of this team, like how do you just see all of that panning out? Because I think we know what he brings is sort of the missing element, just that other off the dribble creator, which you could tell the Cavs not having Sexton later in the year, they really missed that. And now you're getting someone who I think was like fifth or sixth and made pull-up jumpers last year. <laughs> um, so like we get, I get what he brings from a, Oh, this is what they were missing, but how does he fit into this, this eco ecosystem in your estimation? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, a pretty natural fit. Like, I still kind of anticipate that they are going to stagger Garland and Mitchell a bit. Like, I think ideally you want to have it where one of Mobley and Allen is on the court at all times. Like, Mobley was functionally the, the backup center last year. And I, I think you still want to do that in most matchups. And I think you want to do the same thing with Garland and Mitchell to kind of make sure that there isn't kind of a, a drop off at any point that you have at least one elite defensive player on the interior and you have one elite offensive creator on, uh, on the perimeter. And I, I think when they're together, it's going to be really, really fun for both of them because Donovan Mitchell hasn't played with anybody. Like, I think there's probably an argument uh, that Garland was a better player than Mitchell last year. Um, I, I wouldn't push back if someone says Mitchell is better. Uh, I, I like uh, EPM a, a, as a kind of a catch-all metric, and they have Garland and Mitchell kind of side-by-side. -side. But Mitchell hasn't played with anyone that's even in that conversation to this point in his career. And I, I think to to borrow, because we're we're still kind of in football season, waiting for the NBA to start, to borrow a comparison, it's a little bit like Tyreek Hill and Waddle on the Dolphins, where you can't really double either side. You can't shade right. over defensively because you got these two kind of dynamic playmakers. And you look at the number of three pointers that they took, and it's I think it's only like two per game less than Stephen Clay in, in 2016 did a, as a duo. And when you add that kind of like three point volume with the ability to put the ball on the floor and the playmaking they have, I think it's going to be really, really dynamic as a pairing. Yeah, they and I think w when you mentioned it's natural for both of them to sort of play off the ball, it, I think you're just absolutely right. And like Mitchell struggled a little bit with that last year, but in historically, and even with Darius Garn, like if you look at just their spot up percentages were way higher for both of them than they were last year. Um, and defensively, though. Are there concerns there? I'm assuming that impacts, and I'll ask you about who's going to start at the three or who plays the most minutes at the three. That might definitely determine how they round that out. But are you concerned about that, just having two, you know, not super big guards there? Uh, is that an issue? You mentioned that Mitchell's already talked about how he is going to be, he can play defense and he will play defense mm -hmm. here. But are there any concerns about this pairing on that side of the floor? I think there's some concerns. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with the starting lineup. Uh, one thing I'll note is when Garland, Sexton, Mobley, and Allen played together last year, they actually had a 100 defensive rating. Like, it was a really good defense. And Mitchell is a little bit bigger than Sexton. He's a little taller, longer. He's stronger. And, I mean, at least in his first two years in the NBA, he was actually, like, pretty decent on the defensive end. And at, at the very least, he's an event defender, right? Like, he goes out and he kind of generates those steals. And I think you saw in Toronto when Gary Trent Jr. came from Portland, kind of showed defensive flashes, but wasn't a good defensive player. Having those active hands uh, with someone that's playing kind of positional defense can help the team defense overall, even if they do have some deficiencies individually. So when I, I look at how good Garland, Okoro, Larry Markinen, uh, Mobley, and Allen were 
uh, defensively and offensively. Because uh, in terms of net ratings or, or offensive and defensive ratings, they would have had the best defensive rating in the league and the third best offensive rating in the league. And when if you're assuming that Okoro is still starting at the three, if you're just talking about swapping Larry Markkinen for Donovan Mitchell, like I, I think that makes you like maybe a little more dynamic. Like I, 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 <laughs> I, I feel like at the very least they should be able to sustain the, the same kind of defensive impact that they had with that lineup. Because Lowry, while he played good positional defense and he played team defense within the Cavs scheme, he's not the most mobile guy when, when you're talking about defending on the perimeter. Right. And I would just like to point out, like, you still have Jared Allen behind everything and Evan Mobley just everywhere all at once, all the time. So it's like yeah. that makes you feel like somewhat confident. Real life, J.B. Bickerstaff named pretty much everyone else on the roster has a chance to start at the three <laughs> for the Cavs. I'm going to your J.B. Bickerstaff for this podcast. Who are you starting at the three uh, with the with the four locks? So I, I've, if I have to do power rankings, let's do small four power rankings, Dan. Let, let's why we're let's, here. Let's <laughs> Leading candidate would be Isaac Okoro. Um, I. You know, I know the numbers were on a volume of wide, wide open shots. Like, I, I think Second Spectrum said the closest defender on his three-point shots was like nine feet away. But after December, he did at least shoot 50% from the floor and 40% from three, and he is a good perimeter defensive player. Um, I'm curious to see what it looks like after his first real offseason. Um, but, you know, I, I think historically speaking, he's kind of the inverse of Sexton where none of his box score numbers look impressive, but the impact stats have kind of been there and the lineup has been better with him on the court. So for that reason, I give Okoro an edge. My number two is Dean Wade. And, and, it's, yeah. not, and it's not just because of the extension. It's the fact that when Larry was out last year, Dean stepped in and those lineups were great. He played really good defensively. He's big. He's six, nine. He kind of allows you to do a little bit of that tall ball, although he's much more mobile uh, on the defensive end of the court and can kind of stick with wings. Um, I kind of value Okoro and Dean in those spots because they're the low usage guys that you kind of want to have alongside of Garland and Mitchell. And third, I guess I have to go with Karis Levert because uh, I think in a vacuum, he's probably the fifth best player on this team. Uh, all the reports out of camp is that he's looking great. He's one of kind of the, the standouts so far. He's, uh, he talked about how he didn't have training camp last off season. He hasn't had a training camp in a while. He, he finally had one. He's working out with Garland and Mobley basically all off season. Uh, he went to a keto diet and, and he said, now that it's a regular season, he's going a little more keto friendly, uh, versus strictly keto. Um, but I, I was listening to Chris Fedor and, and he said that the Cavs have kind of been asking Karis like earlier in your career, when you were in Brooklyn, you were kind of put on guys as the stopper and, you weren't a stopper. You, you've never been a stopper, but you know, you did an okay job and you committed to that end of the floor. So I, I can see if they want to kind of go the most dynamic look possible. You have Karis Levert there, but personally I'd rather have Levert as that six man and kind of distribute the ball handling a little more evenly throughout the 48 minutes. Especially with Rubio not going to be ready to start the season. Having Levert yeah. off the bench makes so much sense. Uh, yeah. Let's dig into those guys a little bit more. So Isaac Okoro, you and I talked about in the last podcast we did how there needed to be room to kind of explore what else he could do on offense, and maybe that would open up the rest of his game. Does the addition of Mitchell, though, like kind of in a way it complicates that development but simplifies this is what you need to do, and now it's just mission critical that you hit your wide open threes and that you're able to make decisions if guys are ever going to close out on you or, or defend you from beyond the arc? It's not only the addition of Mitchell, it's the other kind of major thing that seems to be coming out of training camp, which is that Evan Mobley appears to have made a pretty significant leap. Um, they're talking about him. Mobley talked about it himself, but uh, more perimeter game really worked on his face up, worked on his dribbling, he worked on his pull up and all kind of indications are he was the loudest guy at practice, which was never the case last year. Uh, he's, he's become a more vocal leader and, and they feel like he's kind of already making that star leap and if that's the case you're now talking about garland mitchell and mobley kind of being the the initiators of that offense and i think that simplifies things for isaac Okoro in a lot of ways like it's not just stand in the corner and like hit your corner threes he needs to do that but he is a really intelligent off-ball player he's someone that um you know uh, cuts well to the basket he finishes well at the rim he's got good hands 
if Mobley all of a sudden has a, a bit of a face-up game and, and he's initiating out of the high post and, and all of a sudden you have Isaac Okoro cutting back door, like I think that can help make this work a lot. Uh, I think the the <laughs> apparently the film that they gave uh, Mobley to study in the offseason was Giannis, it was Dirk, and KG. So I, I don't right know now. what that yeah. hybrid looks like, but <laughs> I, it sounds fun. Um, You... I think it was towards the end of the 2020-21 season. You implored me to take a closer look at Dean Wade. I ended up falling in love with Dean Wade last season. <laughs> Is there a... I would see why you wouldn't start him, but like mm -hmm. when you're looking at their best lineups or just their most important players, given what... He's just sort of like there everywhere he needs to be on defense. He can stretch the floor and he can get around guys if they're going to close out on him. Is there like a world because this team, a lot of their secondary players feel like one-way players where he becomes mm -hmm. like, the fifth or sixth most important guy to this core, if they're not going to make any other, just looking at who complements the the core four, so to speak right now, best, it feels like it might be him right now. I think fifth is maybe a little high, but I, I can see him being a key part of the rotation. And, and for my money, like I, I think I would have him as the backup small forward this season. Like I, I can see him kind of taking that Jetty Osman role and, he just kind of does all the right things, right? Like he, he he's a really intelligent player. He's a good athlete. Um, he, he can shoot pretty well. I, I think you're you're hoping that his corner three point shooting regresses a little bit because last year was such a weird outlier where he shot like twenty percent from the corners, which just doesn't make sense when you're you're shooting like forty percent from elsewhere. Um, yeah. So I, if that improves, I, I think uh, he's going to be a really natural fit. He is a two-way player, like you said. He's someone that doesn't need the ball a ton, and uh, he, he's just a hard worker. Like it, it's, I think it's one of the really positive developmental stories. And I, I, overall, as Cavs fans, I think we've been a little slow on the uptake here. Like I, I think certain fan bases are, are a little more accustomed to, hey, we got this undrafted player that we developed and really turned into a nice rotation player. Like for a Miami Heat fan, that's a really natural thing. But for a Cavs <laughs> fan, there's always like a little bit of like, OK, but w when when does he turn back into a pumpkin? When does midnight strike? And, and I mean, that's that's a little bit of our mentality in general, because <laughs> all good things must come with some pain. Uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Cavs get good again this offseason and the Warriors come calling for Kevin Durant again. I'm, I'm, I'm wise to their games. Uh, but you know what? I, I think Dean Wade definitely has a real spot in the rotation. I I'm in love with Dean Wade. Like I said, you were the one that really put me onto him. I think it was in 2020 or maybe it was in 2021 at some point, but Karis Levert contract year. He makes a lot of sense on this roster right now because I, I you can never have too many creators just, and that's mm -hmm. what he, he's good at. And with Rubio not being available to start the year, like he just has a clear role, but given that it's a contract year that you have Mitchell and Garland. And even if Rubio, once he's there, is his future with Cleveland complicated at all? Just because one of his biggest struggles, and I've been higher on him, I think, than consensus, probably until mm -hmm. last year where I wasn't out on him, but was just sort of meh. Like his off-ball offense, like his impact to move without it or even just to hit standstill three, it's not, it's not great. Yeah, it really isn't. And, and I'm with you. Like I, I'm uh, Karis Levert, like scratches all of my Hooper instincts. Like I, I just love his, his tough shot making. And I, I think when you look at this roster, the fact that he is such a good pick and roll ball handler is, is something that's really attractive because he, he's that's a natural fit when Jared Allen and Evan Mobley are massive parts of what you do offensively. I would like to see like a little bit more spot ups because like his catch and shoot three pointing uh, three point shooting was over 40 percent last year. It just was on like one attempt a game. Right. Like I, I would like to see him kind of utilize his athleticism to to be more of a cutter off ball to, to play within the system. And I'm curious to see what it looks like. Like I, I'm really encouraged by the fact that he was working out with Garland and Mobley throughout the offseason because you look at the last few years and he's always been in a role that was probably a little too big for where he's at in his career. Like uh, he was basically asked to replace Victor Oladipo in Indiana and playing in Brooklyn when they weren't fully healthy. So he was either a primary or secondary option. If he's the sixth man, I think that's a luxury. Like, I, I think that is an appropriate role for him. And I like what he can do alongside Darius Garland. I, if you're talking about kind of staggering and working rotations, I would actually put him with Garland more than Mitchell. Like, I, I think I'd like to have Mitchell with Rubio or Howell, Howell Meadow, depending on uh, which one is available in the rotation. Um, but I, I like what he can bring to the table. But 
when you're talking about his future with the Cavs, I do think it's still a little bit murky. Like, I, I think this is going to be a real kind of testing grounds for him because he's either going to be a, you know, a good size expiring contract at the trade deadline if things don't work out from a fit standpoint. If Isaac Okoro or Dean Wade really kind of step up, solidify themselves as a starting small forward, maybe you don't care about your calf space as much next offseason. And you go, right. hey, let's extend the, the hometown kid and Karis Levert. We like his fit with the team and we don't have such an urgent need to go out and spend this money. So there's a lot of different ways for this to play out, but I, I think it's really going to be dictated by his play. I also think that's maybe one of the arguments of having Dean Wade come off the bench too, is to have him and Karras play together. It makes a lot of sense with Kevin Love. Mm -hmm. um, those lineups feel like they make a ton of sense. Do you envision, like, I guess the two questions here is when's, when Rubio is healthy, are those two going to play together? Because that gets awkward, awkward, excuse me. And then regardless of whether Levert is starting or not, and I'm with you, I don't, he's probably third on my list of that. Uh, if we were to power rank the starting small forward options, even if he's not starting, should we expect to see like extended run from Garland, Mitchell and Levert where it's just, hey, let's let's attack you with as much ball handling as we can. I think that's going to the three guard pairing, I think, is going to be really heavily dictated by how well Karis Levert plays. Like if he plays well and he's kind of committing to at least playing like team defense and, and you know, not hijacking the offense, I can see it. Because J.B. Bickerstaff will get weird with rotations. They did close games last year with Garland, Sexton, and Rubio all out on the court together. And Karras at Media Day talked about as well that he played with D'Lo and, and Dinwiddie or, or, and Kyrie and Dinwiddie. Like, he's played in kind of these three-guard lineups before. So I, I can see it, and, and maybe it's going to be matchup dependent. Uh, but when you're talking about kind of working a rotation... I just I don't like the fit of him and Mitchell together, but I, I do like the fit of he and Garland. Like if, if you're talking about a second unit, I'd almost have Karis be that first sub to take Mitchell out of the game and having like how will Neto or let's let's say Ricky Rubio. Let's let's talk. Everyone's healthy. We're, we're good to go. Uh, Ricky Rubio, Donovan Mitchell, Dean Wade, Kevin Love and Evan Mobley playing as, as the five like that against second units is pretty damn dynamic. Like you have Neto or Rubio as a, as a table setter, you have Mitchell doing what he does. Like you got Dean Wade kind of playing his role, Kevin Love as a bit of a hub and, and Mobley. We'll see what that is. Like I, I, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, I have not wrapped my head around what a Mobley leap looks like. Like I'm, I'm, I've been kind of managing my expectations when it came to Evan Mobley, like even coming into his rookie year and he keeps exceeding it. And I don't a hundred percent know what to do with that. So you'll have to forgive me a little bit there. Well, uh, that was going to basically be the next question is what are you looking for from year two Mobley? And you're mentioning he's doing all these things like the, the face up game, the pull up jumper. I guess my question there is does having, I, we both know Mitchell and Garland can play off the ball pretty well but does having both of them in addition to other ball handlers when you're at full strength and rubio and lavert does it like repress the opportunity for him to like really plumb the depths of his offensive game to where there might there might be that natural impetus to not use him as a traditional big like this is someone who could still grab the ball get up the floor but like he might not just have it a ton in, in half court situations or do you still think that there will be that investment in that development of just again exploring what he can do on ball because there were so many flashes last year and the things you're saying, like that I didn't even know about before you hopped on this podcast, like how do you not give him that opportunity? Yeah, I, I think they're definitely going to explore that. And it might come with growing pains. Like, uh, let, let's be honest, like the, there's going to be an adjustment for Mitchell. There's going to be an adjustment for Garland. It, Mobley is going to make mistakes as he's developing this skill set. But I think when you look at the ultimate plan for the Cavs, Evan Mobley it, if everything works out according to how it's envisioned, Evan Mobley is supposed to be the best player on this team. And right. like maybe Darius Garland's number two and Donovan Mitchell is number three. Like I, th I think Mitchell is always going to be their leading scorer and kind of lead play finisher. But uh, like Mobley is at the top of that pyramid. So even if it comes with growing pains, I think you want Garland and Mitchell to get these developmental reps playing off of Evan Mobley. And I, I think dribble handoffs are obviously going to be a big part of that. Him kind of working out of the high post. You're going to see a lot of uh, double drags because they, they used a ton of that la last season. Um, I, I think Mobley, I, I saw videos of him working on the pop out of the double drag where he's kind of hitting that three. And uh, he talked about getting the ball uh, off of defensive rebounds and leading the fast break. Like, that's really exciting if you got Garland Mitchell sprinting to each corner with Evan Mobley bringing up the, 
the ball. Like there's a lot of different possibilities. And I think this is going to be an interesting uh, kind of year to examine JB Bickerstaff as well, because he kept getting robbed of tools throughout last off season. He's coming into this year with a lot of different ways that they can play. And I'm excited to see how creative does he start out? Do you start with kind of base sets and build off of that as the season progresses? Do you get weird from the beginning and, and, allow guys to to get accustomed to playing a lot of different styles like there's a lot of ways for this to go and i'm i'm really fascinated to see kind of how jb bickerstaff approaches this season and i also you had mentioned mobley playing backup center i think close to a quarter of his minutes came there last year uh to me it feels like the best way if you really wanted to test the i don't even want to call them limits but like the in the infinite whatever if that's a word of his offensive game during those backup five minutes is probably when he's going to be surrounded by like the best type of spacing. Do you expect those? Cause when you go into like their big man rotation, yeah, there's Kevin love and there's Robin Lopez, but it does feel like it's set up so that when Jared Allen's not on the court, like maybe we even see the share of Mobley's minutes that are coming at the five, not increased dramatically because one Jared Allen has to play. Um, mm -hmm. But it does feel like maybe that's the best situation for them to really see what he can give you offensively is more of a focal point. Yeah. I, I think, the Mobley as like a secondary initiator is going to come within the flow of the game. Like it's probably going to come when only one of Garland or Mitchell is on the court. And I, I agree with you. I think it makes the most sense to do it at that time. You're probably going to have the best spacing around you in, in those opportunities. And you're probably going to have some mismatches to exploit. Like I think most matchups, you're probably going to have Mobley as the backup center, but I can also see like when you're playing against Joel Embiid, it probably makes sense to have Robin Lopez play as the backup center and have Mobley just float around as like the seven one Draymond, just the, the help defender that that's ruining people's lives that made him such an effective player last year. So um, I, I think in nights where Mobley's playing at the five, you might see Dean Wade get a few more minutes at backup power forward. Cause I think you probably want to keep Kevin loves minutes around 18 a game to keep him healthy and fresh. Uh, but one nights where you're playing a little more traditional, maybe Dean Wade's playing at the three more and, and it's basically just Mobley and love playing at the power forward position. Like there's a lot of different ways for this to go. What does a year four leap from Darius Garland look like for this team? And when I was trying to dig into what my answer would be, I want to hear what yours is first. I did not realize, or maybe I realized in real time, he shot 47% basically on off the dribble three pointers after the all-star break. <laughs> and it's just like, he was so good last year. It's tough. You say it's tough to envision what a leap from Mobley looks like. It's tough for me to envision like how much better can Darius Garland get from here, given the season he just came off from. Well, I, I mean, this is the time of year for spicy takes, blind optimism, all that good stuff. I'll give you a, a line prediction for him. I think it's 23 and 10. Uh, I think we are going to see him kind of hit that 60% true shooting percentage, maybe a few uh, field goal attempts less per game, like maybe two less uh, than when he was averaging 25 and 10 after the all-star break. But I think having Mitchell next to him is going to help him be a more efficient player. I think it's going to be harder for teams to play off of him. But in his heart of hearts, he's a pass first guy that likes to get everybody involved. I think he can absolutely have a double digit assist season. And I, I think that should be the goal. But uh, I, I don't think that's necessarily going to come fully at the expense of his scoring because you recognize him being willing to take those pull up threes opens up the game for everybody else. Like the spacing was horrid last year, yeah. absolutely the worst of his career. And he was still able to generate these looks for Mobley and Allen. Uh, high percentage looks at the rim. He was still able to get to his spots. Uh, but you saw in the, the play in games, especially teams just completely ignored everyone else. And they, they doubled the hell out of Garland and just um, try to wear him down, wear him down, wear him down. And you're not going to be able to do that same thing against Donovan Mitchell. So um, I, I don't think enough has been made over the relationship Garland and Mitchell are going to have on the court. Like I, I think, both of them are going to have the best years of their careers playing with one another because they just really accentuate one another's strengths. And uh, I don't think the learning curve on the offensive end is going to be as steep as some people think. It doesn't exist. It's going to be seamless. I'm calling it now. You said it's the tis the season <laughs> for optimism. It, it's just going to work. I like uh, it. I like it. The He is so under control when he gets inside the arc, and yet it creates like this defensive anarchy or chaos so they don't know what to do. And I'm wondering if he can parlay what I think should be better spacing just by virtue of having Donovan Mitchell. And if Evan Mobley really is just like 
Giannis times Dirk times Kevin Durant times Kevin Garnett, like all these players. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if he can turn that into more frequency at the rim, maybe some more free throw attempts. But to I your point before, that. yeah, I, that is like the only thing I can envision because his passing last season was just like there. And now he's just going to have more room to work with. And um, the looks at the rim for all of these guys, Trey Young was the only player in the league who had more assists at the rim last year than Darius Garland <laughs> like this I don't if people haven't really stopped and considered how good the Cavs might be I just beg them to go back and watch Darius Garland because that yeah. was like for so much of the season he was playing like an all NBA player type player and yeah. I, that's why when I was digging through his game I'm like I don't really know where he's supposed to get better and like I said it, it would be nice to see him be a better finisher at the rim maybe get there a little more frequently um generate some more free throw looks but aside from that it's just this is someone who might be like they sign him to that that max extension and it'll escalate if he makes an all NBA team. I, I don't know that I'm going to predict it right now, but Darius Garland is absolutely in that conversation. I think I would make the argument next season. I think he probably winds up being their best player looking at the setup of the team long term. I think you want it to be Mobley. I think you make this move for yeah. Mitchell because you think it's going to be Mobley. But right now. I think it's, I don't want to say pretty clearly because Donovan Mitchell is really good, but I, I think it's Darius Garland and it might be by a comfortable margin this year. Yeah, I, I, I think it's Garland for this season as well. Um, I I think what a leap looks like for Darius Garland is similar to what we saw at Jared Allen last year, where it's not like necessarily adding something that wasn't there. It's the improvements in the margins. It's the experience, the better decision-making. Uh, maybe the turnover rate comes down a little bit. Maybe, uh, you know, a few more free throws, the true shooting percentage gets bumped up. Like, I think that's where we're going to see it. It's, it's improvement in the margins within a better team context. And I think that's what Jared Allen benefited from last year. And I think that's what Garland is going to benefit from this year. And uh, to circle back to the stat I gave earlier, I think the best like kind of indicator of how good Darius was as a playmaker last season was the fact that the lineup of him, Okoro, Lowry, Mobley, and Allen would have had the third best offensive rating in the league last season. Like that there's not, that was supposed to be the, the most difficult year to make Mobley and Allen work because neither of them had an outside shot. You know, Mobley was, was raw offensively. Um, and then you add in Isaac Okoro, who is filling in for Colin Sexton. So you lose a lot of space in there. And you have Lowry Markinen, who's not going to beat anyone off the dribble. He's not like a Joe Ingles or Bogdanovich that that's, you know, uh, can handle some playmaking and think, make things easier for Garland. It was like the, just the sheer talent of Darius Garland that got that offense to a high level and, and maintain like every time he was on the court they were a really good offensive team uh I, and i just think adding donovan mitchell to that mix adding the depth that they have um it, it's going to make his life a whole lot easier and i think it's going to allow him to kind of be in that natural point guard role that he he loves to play in do we have any sense of when ricky rubio is going to come back from that that torn left acl and what type of we know what role i guess he's going to play for this team like how much do you anticipate him him playing for this group when he is healthy i don't think he's going to be a major contributor this season um i just i just don't uh it's acl is one of those things where it's almost like the second season you look better um it's nice he said at media day that he's at the part of his rehab where he returns to practice now so he he's in the gym he's getting shots up he, he's getting a little bit of a sweat he, he's monitoring his body uh, he said he, he'd like to be back for December, but it could just as easily be January or February. Um, it's going to be dependent on how his body reacts. But I think that's why you bring in a quality backup in Howell Neto. Like, I, I would have been perfectly fine with Neto being the backup point guard for this full season, especially when you talk about having Donovan Mitchell, who can probably handle a lot of that backup point guard responsibilities. Karis LeVert, they can handle ball handling. Like, I, I think they're in a pretty good spot. So, I think Ricky's role this season is more than anything being kind of that uh, mentor to both Garland and Mitchell, you know, like uh, both of them credited Ricky in the past for being part of their leaps that they've made in, in their careers. And uh, Ricky's energy and media day was kind of hilarious. Like uh, they, they asked him about the mentorship that he had of Garland and Mitchell. And he was kind of sitting back like, my work's done here. Like, do you see what they've done? <laughs> like, he, like, he was just like kind of confident. He's like, that's that's why I have this three year contract. It's because I did my job. Like, look, look at them. But I, I think having someone like that in their ears on the bench, like, they, it's so important to have that kind of veteran leadership. And uh, I think when he comes back, he's not going to be asked to do as much as he did last 
last season. Like he's just not going to need to. Like he, he did that much because Sexton went down because they had the injuries that they had. And he's he's going to be able to kind of bring it along a little slowly. But I think just having, you know, someone that is going to bring the ball up the court, get the team into their sets, push and transition a little bit, hit those head hit ahead passes. Like I, I think that's a, a nice it's a nice piece to have as your like ninth or tenth best player. I mentioned this in the outline. I don't really have a question for him. He was really good last year. We kind of know what his role is going to be on this team. Can we just take a second to appreciate that Kevin Love is just still here and how freaking cool <laughs> it is that he's part of this iteration of the Cavs that all of a sudden goes from like, well, where are they going to? Okay, we see the outline here after getting Mobley and what Garland did last year too. Oh, fuck. The championship window is just open again. Like there, look, would you put them as one of the three, four most likely contenders? No. But if you told me that no. the Cavs made it out of the East last year, I'm not going to argue with you. There's so many teams that I can envision coming out of that. It's really just, it's kind of like a mind fuck too, but it's also just cool that given everything that Kevin Love has gone through in Cleveland, including some of his body language in like previous years, that he's just still here and that this has come like, I wouldn't even call it full circle, but this team is taking like 80 different directions and ended up at this fascinating, really effective end game. And look, Kevin Love is still there. I'm 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 really happy for him. Like the interesting thing about the Cavs, like when you're talking about wouldn't be surprised, like if they eventually come out of the East or whatever, like the team that's put together now, I, I think it's fair to say like the path to them contending is internal growth. It's it's on themselves, right? Like there, there's the pieces here in place and it's does Mobley hit his apex? Does Garland and Mitchell improve? Does Jared Allen make improvements? Do these other guys step up and kind of be that fifth player? Like that's such an interesting place to be in because they're the only limitation is themselves. It's not a big question. Like if the Knicks got Donovan Mitchell, the question is going to be, okay, who's the star that Brunson and Mitchell lures to New York? Cause these guys aren't going to do it on their own. Uh, so this is a totally different question for the cats. And it's so cool that Kevin Love gets to be a part of this. Uh, we had Joe and Rafa um, on, on our podcast, uh, Spanish voice of the Cavs and, and Cavs beat reporter. And, and they were talking about how Kevin Love's demeanor has changed so much where he's kind of adopted. Like, you know, when you have two dogs and one passes away and the younger one kind of inherits like the personality traits of the older dog. Mm -hmm. That's basically Kevin Love right now stepping into the Channing Fry role. Like he's oh like, you know what? Amazing. We've got the vets here. We've got the leadership that he's there for levity. He's there. You know what? Like I'm here to give you wisdom, but I'm also here to let you know, we got to have some fun. We got to like, he, he's just there for the vibes. And that's such a great place for him to be at because like, I've loved Kevin Love as a player. Like I, I wanted him uh, to, to join the Cavs before it happened. It's amazing that he's been on the team for as long as he has, but like to see him like, happy comfortable like having a role that works for him like uh th this finally working out and, and the ending being different for him in cleveland like that's really refreshing because every like as great as that championship team was almost all of the breakups were a little bit sour like Kyrie got weird jr got a little weird like where they had to tell him to to stay home uh like lebron obviously leaves to the lakers like they're it just didn't end on good terms with just about anybody. So the fact that Kevin Love outlasts Kyrie, outlasts LeBron, outlasts, he outlasted Sexton. I don't think anyone saw that coming. Like this guy, he just can't kill him. He's like a cockroach. Like I, I'm just so happy that this is how it gets down. And you know what? Like now that Larry Markinen's uh, out of the picture, like there's a pretty clear role to Kevin Love just kind of being that third big for them that just kind of fits and. It, you know, plays his stretch game and just kind of helps the, the spacing and the vibes. Him being the chief operating officer of vibes after where it was at like two years ago, like where it seemed like this relationship was headed is incredible. It's, yeah. it's super cool. It's just incredible. Uh, what does improvement for Jared Allen look like at this point? Because his everyone I think has known what he brings defensively and he's more mobile than most quote unquote traditional bigs. He made like towards the end of his first season with the Cavs and then all of last year, like the offensive package is more expansive, a little bit more broad than I think people credit when you're looking at bigs who can make, you know, different decisions. Once they get the ball, it's not just set a screen roll and you need to finish. Like he can stop and pivot. He can move his feet. Like he has the hook shot going for him. He can throw like not Robert Williams, the third type passes, but he can keep the ball moving while he's still going downhill. How does he actually like get better? 
Yeah, what he talked about kind of working on in the offseason was, you know, continuing work on his post-up game. Um, like, th- there wasn't a lot of times last season where they just kind of threw it into the post and let Jared Allen go to work, and I don't anticipate that this year. But, you know, when you get a mismatch, you know, that quick seal, when, when you have that deep position, like, establish yourself and go up. Uh, he said he worked on his footwork in the post game and also his playmaking, like really studying film, like making sure that, hey, if the defense collapses in on me, I want to make sure I'm making the right reads, that I'm kicking it out to the appropriate shooters. And I, I thought that kind of stuff, passing on the short roll, like the improvement in the margins. Once again, I, I think that's where Jared Allen can really improve. And um, it's it's just so nice that he's kind of willing to like embrace this role. Like he, he just... He, he, once again, he, he's one of those vibes guys. I, I don't know if you saw when he was uh, voted as an all-star. He's just sitting on his uh, phone playing Pokemon, and he's just like, oh, cool, yeah. that's fun. Like, he's just he's just uh, a great presence to have around it, and it looks like all the stuff that he was working on, all the things he talked about working on, uh, improving as a vocal leader, too, right? Like, understanding that you're going to have that vantage point a, as a center uh, where you're going to need to be calling things out defensively. It's it's that kind of stuff that isn't going to jump out in the box score, but does make you in a more effective team. I just remember over a year ago now killing the contract that the Cavs signed him <laughs> to. And it wasn't so much the player as what I thought the fit was going to be with Mobley. Oof, talk about being wrong. Happy to be wrong, but so wrong. <laughs> uh, and I do remember, I think it was at the All-Star weekend, people were killing him for his, you know, quote-unquote fit. And I'm just like, yeah. this dude is so relatable that that's what he wore to such a big event. Like, I faved it. That's like, I want to yeah. see that. I'm all here for Jared Allen there. I... I... I think he's one of my favorite personalities on the team. Like they're all a bunch of weirdos. Like they all just seem to like, you know, they're they're a bunch of introverts. And I I think that's actually something where Mitchell helps out too, because he's such a big personality. And um, you you hear the reports of just kind of how he's elevating the intensity level in practice and that sort of thing. Uh, But it's all these guys that just love the game and and just like hanging out. Right. Like it's, I, I think personality really got factored in a lot when it came to this team building process. It's what, what kind of guys are going to be happy in Cleveland that are building the culture that we're trying to build. Like it, it, it's tough because when you're the Cleveland Cavaliers, like no one's going to take you saying, Oh, we're trying to build a culture seriously because th- there's no track record there. Right. But you have to at least set a standard and try your best to kind of adhere to it. Like that's how you eventually turn around. That's how Toronto turned it around. Right. It was Dwayne Casey pound the rock or we're going to be a try hard team. And, and I think they, the Cavs were kind of able to talk this into existence. Yeah. You mentioned the team culture too. And I thought a lot of stories came out after Donovan Mitchell left Utah about how big and good of a personality he was. He got like this, bad rap nationally because it was anticipated that he would eventually want out of Utah, even though as far as we know, the trade requests never actually came. And I do agree with you just based on the stories I've heard, like what happened in Utah, both published and unpublished. And then he just never seemed like a bad dude. And look, you're going to endear yourself to me forever. When one of the immediate reactions you have to the trade is you figure out a way to work yourself into the Brian Windhorst meme. That was just an (laughs) iconic tweet. From him, just absolutely <laughs> iconic, and so the vibes are good coming. I, I don't you know who I don't know how much stock everyone places in the uh intangibles, but like the vibes emanating from this team are just incredible. They they are really good, and, and like I said, the the fact that he immediately goes to Darius Garland's camp in Nashville, and okay, let's get a, a training camp in before training camp with, with all the guys on the team. Like uh the the fact that like. He's kind of embraced the the situation, right? Where he's like, you know what? Like, I, I'm here to be a part of this. This was a, a 44 win team uh, that probably should have won 50 if they were healthy. Like, I'm just trying to be a part of it. I, I even liked it at his introductory press conference the fact that he was just so honest and open. Like, yeah, I expected to go to the Knicks. Everybody expected for me to go to the Knicks, but when I like when I heard who was still in Cleveland after the trade, I like lost my mind. I was running around on the golf course. Like I'm, I'm all, I'm friends with Darius Garland. I, I know these guys. I, I played with Garland in pro-ams uh, pri- prior to this trade even occurring. Like uh, he, he's someone that, you know, values basketball. Like I think basketball is the most important thing. And when we had Tony Jones on the podcast, he talked about, yeah, like Mitchell didn't request a trade yet. Like he kind of saw the writing on the roll. Uh, writing on the wall when you trade Royce O'Neal, Brian Winhorst, um, <laughs> and, and trade Rudy Gobert, yeah, you're you're not going to you're not going to keep Mitchell after that point. But uh, basketball's always kind of been the number one thing, and the fact that he owned up, hey, 
I wasn't in the best shape last season. Uh, my defense is not where it should be. I, I came into the league. Like it was funny reading the draft express profile on him where he was uh, kind of labeled as a not dynamic three and D guard. Like it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny to look back on that uh, now, but uh, it, he said all the right things. The vibe seemed to be good. And I mean, if you want to abandon the media day, uh, kind of vibe of always optimism and all that. If things do go sideways, like you have a couple of years to figure this out, but um, like in, in two years, he's going to be 27, 28 years old, still in his prime uh, w- with another year on his contract. Like the Knicks if, will still give you four first round picks at least for him. Yeah. Worst case scenario, the Cavs are, are going to be able to, to make a pivot there. But uh, I, I think from a basketball fit standpoint, um, there's not a lot of places that offer a guard as dynamic and as good of a fit as Darius Garland with the back end support of Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Is the wing rotation slash three spot, is that the biggest concern for the team this season or is there a bigger concern than that? I I think it's the biggest question mark. I wouldn't necessarily say concern because when you have those four, I think it takes pressure off what you need from the small forward position. Like I feel pretty decent about the fact that you have, Isaac Okoro, Dean Wade, Karis LeVert, Jetty Osman, uh, Lamar Stevens, who who played heavy minutes last season. Like one of the benefits of last season was the fact that so many guys got opportunities and actually stepped up. Like they they were still a, a good starting lineup when Lamar Stevens was playing in there last year when Okoro got hurt. Like uh, you kind of got a better idea of the depth you have. God, even Dylan Windler is talking about how he finally had a healthy in off the season. The starting three spot, according to Bickerstaff, he mentioned Dylan he, Windler. <laughs> he's talking about how he's turning heads and he he worked on speeding up his jumper and he's finally able to jump off both legs. Like, uh, it, I still find this hard to believe. Basketball Reference, I think it's lying to me, but it, it says that Dylan Windler played 50 games last year. I. I, I still can't wrap my hand around that as a concept because uh, it, it feels like he's never been healthy, but like maybe Windler kind of steps up and, and that, that changes the math. So it, it's, there's a lot of options that you at least feel decent about. It'd be really nice though. If someone stu- uh, stepped forward and kind of solidified themselves as that fifth guy that fits with the core four. I do think even though they are drained of their pick equity and I don't necessarily you know, some people don't like talking trades before we see this team play a game. I think that's absolutely positively fair. But if yeah. it doesn't pan out, where let's say the three spot becomes like you're looking for that perfect fifth complement for your closing unit or something, they're not like they're assets strapped, but they're not asset poor. They still have yeah. some nice mid end salaries they could move. If you decide to move on from Isaac Okoro, he has another year left on his rookie scale deal that teams might be interested in. Maybe you can go out. I know people have mentioned Jay Crowder. I don't love that fit in Cleveland. Um, for them, I don't necessarily the... see him as like a meaningful upgrade over Dean Wade. And and when you are kind of asset strapped to some extent, you have to you kind of have to pick and choose when like how meaningful is an upgrade if we're giving up second round picks. And I think you just if I'm them and they'll be buyers just because they're going to be so good. But like you don't know what happens in the middle of the season teams that are bad. Like does a yeah. Reggie Bullock all of a sudden become available? Does Royce O'Neal have a good year? But the Nets implode like everyone expects <laughs> and he becomes available. So they are still built to make a move on that scale. If yep. they like, let's call it the Jay Crowder scale, but not for Jay Crowder, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, and they'll have the cap space. Like even after the Dean Wayne extension, I, I think they'll still have kind of like that like four, maybe 14 million uh, to use like a, a little more than a mid-level exception. Like you can bring in a good backup three for, for that kind of money. I mean, you could bring in, you could re-sign Karis Levert, then be able to use your full non-taxpayers mid-level exception probably. Yeah. And that money's going to get you like maybe even a starting three at that point. You can bring in a Jay Crowder if you want. He's a UFA. <laughs> <laughs> so what does the, the, 10 man rotation look like for this team at full strength. There are clearly like we have the locks, but like once you get past Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, Evan Mobley, Jared Allen, Karis Levert and Dean Wade all feel like they're locks to be in there. Like how do you sort of flesh out like the other, I think I just named seven guys, six or seven. How do you flesh out those final spots? Yeah. Let me just take it from the top here because my brain is broken and I've done so much damage to it, but uh, like starters, Garland, uh, Mitchell, Okoro, Mobley, Allen. I think backup, you're looking at Rubio, Levert, Wade, Love, and Lopez. Although if Mobley's the, the backup five, I think in those games, 
you'd probably see like either Jetty Osmond, Lamar Stevens, maybe Dylan Windler, depending on who kind of earns that opportunity and, and probably matchup dependent as well. But uh, that's, that's kind of how I would see it. I I think you're probably going nine, maybe 10 guys deep uh, on, on any given night. Yeah. I didn't even mention Kevin Love in that first iteration. So yeah, they feel like they have like probably eight or nine locks. If you were ever to go 10 deep, and then that they'll very much be fungible from there. But I don't know if they need to go because Rolo is interesting, just like a solid player to have. But if you want Moby yeah. to log back up five time, I don't know how much of a need you you have for him on a night to night basis. Like you said, it could be matchup dependent. Yeah, I, I think he's just kind of an insurance plan where if you lose Jared Allen like you did last season, you have someone that can actually go out there and set screens. You have a guy that can eat minutes that isn't Moses Brown, right? Like so, or or Ed Davis. So I think Rolo again, another good vibes guy. I think that's a, another priority bringing him in. Uh, but what you know, he, tweet? Like, he always wants to be interviewed on media day by a Muppet or something and is disappointed <laughs> that he never was or whatever. That was great. Yeah. It, it, although he said that Anthony Davis was probably the closest, oh, yeah, the that was... <laughs> which I thought was just a hilarious line. Uh, yeah. Like there's, there's good depth there. Like if you're talking about that second unit of Rubio, Levert, Wade, Love, Lopez, and then beyond that, you have Neto, Lamar Stevens, who I think proved a, a fair bit, Jetty Osmond, Dylan Windler, like all of a sudden we've named 14 players and, and they do have an open roster spot right now. So uh, we'll, we'll see if they end up using it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe you elevate an RJ Nemhard from the G League and and get Sharif Cooper, who's currently in town with the Cavs on a training camp deal onto the two way. Um, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see th- how things go. And of course, you got Brobley as well. Uh, Isaiah Mobley, who will likely be playing with the charge, but Long term uh, could be their backup four or five for them. What is the go to crunch time unit for this team? There are four locks, regardless of matchup. Like there's, there, there are just four locks for that unit. How do you see the the fifth spot? What, what do you think will be the most commonly used crunch time lineup then for this team? Might be the best way to phrase it. I think it's the starting five with either Okoro or Levert. Uh, I think if they're playing from behind and if the camp buzz about Levert being in great shape and committing to both ends of the floor and all, all the kind of stuff that, that you hear at this time of year, if that comes to fruition, like I think if you're playing from behind and you need buckets, like you, you might go with kind of that three guard lineup. Like I, I think JB Bickerstaff is going to get a little weird with it. Uh, but if I had to guess, I think it would be Garland, Mitchell, Okoro, Mobley, Allen, just because that's such a good defensive uh, front court. Uh, I know people make a lot out of uh, Isaac Okoro's height, which I I, I don't get. Like, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, just the, the concept of, oh, guys, just shoot over them. Like, he, he needs to improve kind of his physicality as a defender. But when you talk even about standing reach, he's got a longer standing reach than Jay Crowder. Like, he, he's a strong physical defender, and I, I feel pretty confident I'm not sure about his offensive side of the floor, but I feel good about his ability to guard small forwards, especially within this team context. Yeah, I don't know if this is spicy, but like Isaac Okoro uh, has been a lot better on defense for his career than DeAndre Hunter has thus far. I think oh, yeah. it's probably fair to say. say. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, this... I think that's fair. Like you look at B Ball Index, for example, they have Okoro like top five in, in a lot of kind of their on ball and off ball chaser metrics. Uh, he, he's he's pretty damn good defensively. And I, I think if Okoro was as good offensively as he was defensively, like if you just switched how good he is on both ends, everyone would be like, oh, this is a hell of a player. But uh, offense rules at, at the end of the day in the NBA is more important. I, I think no matter what your position, offense is always going to be a little more than half the game. But, you know, he, he made some strides last season. So if he builds off of that, I, I think he has the best chance to kind of be that fifth guy with this team. You mentioned J.B. Bickerstaff, and this was a question I, you know by now I ask all the time, but J.B. Bickerstaff actually said, I'm paraphrasing, um, I don't think it was media day, but it was, it was at one of the practices, we're going to get weird with our lineups because that's what we do. Paraphrasing. Yep. That is just a comment that speaks to me, resonates with me on such a profound level. What is the quirky, bonkers, weirdo lineup you're hoping to see from uh, the team this season? Um, I don't know exactly what it would be but it involves evan mobley playing at the small forward position like i, I you know <laughs> like let's just get weird at some point where it's like uh I, we need to come up with a nickname for garland and mitchell uh i, I don't know what that's going to be uh you can go splash gnomes if you want to play on how everyone talks about how short splash they are gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> we, we we got a lot of directions we go. It's a long season. We, we can figure something out there. But I I, I want to see what Evan Mobley kind of playing on the perimeter a little more looks like. So I, I think the weirdest lineups are, are probably going to involve him uh, spacing the game out. Like maybe it's Mobley, Love, and Allen at some point where where Love is functionally kind of playing that corner three point shooting role and, and allows Mobley to to get out there and uh, play in space a little bit. Uh, I would, I, they actually tried that a little bit last season. The results were not great, but this team is obviously built, um, different cosmetically. I think mine would probably be built around like Mobley at the five units, but yeah. you've just punted on size for the rest of that lineup. Like <laughs> give me, um, Rubio, Le- Garland, Mitchell, and Levert. Levert. Done. Like <laughs> even look, you know what? It doesn't even need to be Rubio. Like you can put Isaac Okoro in there. Like, let's just make sure that the, you know, sure up the defense as much as possible with size. Though Rubio might be a better defender, even post ACL injury. So you know, I want to see that. The Fast and Furious movies were filmed in Cleveland a, a lot of times. So you know, we we can uh, we can kind of embrace that and just go small around Mobley. Um, I, I would love to see it, but so this team's over under is set at forty seven point five as we're recording this. Would you take the over under on that right now? And where do you see them sort of lining up relative to the rest of the Eastern Conference? And are there any specific teams that? if you're scaling ahead to the playoffs or just in general that you think might be like particularly difficult matchups for them. Um, I'm lucky. I'm, I live in lawless Canada and I, I placed an over bet on the Cavs prior to the Mitchell trade. So I, I think oh I got boy. them at 42 and a half, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. I would still, I'm pounding that over 52 wins is my prediction uh, for the Cavs this season. Um, I think, when you look at the Eastern Conference, the team that stands out as the most difficult matchup is the Milwaukee Bucks, just because they have that kind of length. They have probably the best player in the game in Giannis. Uh, they have the experience, which the Cavs are, are really lacking. Uh, I just think that they can be a nightmare matchup. Philly can be a little difficult, too, as well, for a lot of the same reasons. And uh, the, the grifting that, that, that they'll bring to the table, uh, that's sure to drive me nuts this season. Um, I, I think... I feel good about the Cavs chances in the regular season to overtake some teams. Like you look Robert Williams, eight to 12 weeks to resume basketball activities. Like that's going to have a major impact. The the fact that the coaching situation in Boston is going to have a major impact. I think Miami got a little bit worse in the off season, a little bit older as well. Uh, They, they didn't kind of make the moves you're anticipating. If you're talking about how I feel about the Cavs relative to other teams with confidence in a playoff series, I would have them lower but I think realistically in the regular season, this team can absolutely kind of get home court advantage. And I kind of have them in like that three seed where um, maybe it's the Sixers and, and Bucks ahead of them. I'll eventually do my standing, like sit down and do my standing prediction. So I'm not just throwing these off the cuff takes out there, but here's every team I'm prepared to say will be definitely better than the Cavs during the regular season, the Bucks. And that's just the end of the list. Like there are teams you want to say Boston and I'm like getting increasingly high on Philly. I get it why you would put teams there. But when you look at the structure of the East, it's incredibly deep, but no one actually seems outside of reach of Cleveland. Milwaukee at full strength might come closest because the top of their roster is just so absurdly good. We don't know what's going to happen with Chris Middleton's wrist at this point. And so if you want to say there's, you're not, you know, if you told me the Cavs were the one seed, the two seed to finish the year, uh, I'm not going to be shocked. And I do think, And I'm not even, I don't mean to dilute what it means to be a championship contender, but it does feel like there could be like 10 teams that realistically have a chance to the title this year. The Cavs are just in that discussion. We do need to wait and see like how all this comes together. You're still, not only are you integrating Mitchell, but you're relying a lot on a bunch of young players. Like Mobley's going into year two. And like the expectations we've saddled with are just, you know, astounding. But this team is like in, like that is a realistic high end outcome for them. And that just makes me, so excited and i can't wait to see this squad just in action because i think that they're going to be gangbusters personally yeah i mean realistically this is a team that's probably going to prioritize the regular season more than just about any team like milwaukee is probably going to take the long view they took the long view last year that they they know that they have the experience and they want to be healthy for when the games really matter miami takes the same kind of approach philly misses time uh brooklyn katie and Kyrie are probably going to miss 20 games apiece because that's just what happens like Cavs are really incentivized to make a splash in the regular season and go out and overachieve and uh, i think it, like we we in the off season when we talk about standings we almost act like the regular season standings are 
dictated by everybody kind of sitting down, having a roundtable conversation about the strengths and weaknesses of every roster. And you know what? Right. We will come to a consensus on where these teams end up. But in reality, like it's whichever teams don't drop the the game, the stupid game in Orlando that they they're not supposed to drop, or uh, th that play with consistency, that have the the most uh, the best injury luck, and uh, like even Miami last year, like I don't think anyone has them as the best team in the Eastern Conference, but they were the one seed. Uh, mm -hmm. When the Cavs had LeBron the first time, Toronto was the one seed or Atlanta was the one seed, right? Like uh, nobody thought that those were the best teams, but they had the best regular season. And from a Cavs standpoint, if you want to win a playoff round, if you want to make a splash in this season, which I, I think that should be the goal is to try to win a, a series and to try to get home court. Getting home court's really going to matter, though, because if you're talking about a playoff series, I am going to favor all of those teams that have experience. I'm going to favor the Milwaukee's, the Philly, the Miami, the yeah. Boston's like experience really, really matters. And I, I think the best path to the Cavs kind of having a great season is by having a great regular season and giving yourself an easier first round matchup where you're playing against. And, and this is the funny part because the East is so good. You're not going to get an easy matchup. You're probably playing like an Atlanta or a Toronto or a Brooklyn or Chicago. Like, there, there is no easy matchup, but it's a lot easier than playing these teams that have legitimate title aspirations. And maybe I'm a little too drunk on Cleveland in this moment, but even I will when you never, at, I will never call you out on that. Don't you worry. <laughs> when you look at how good the East is, there are situations, Brooklyn, obviously, but like even Boston with the RW3 injury and then the Ime Udoka situation. Um, even the Bucks a little bit with the health of Chris Middleton, but not them so much. Yeah. But th there are situations that are more combustible to where I'd say, even if we don't see the highest end outcome from the Cavs, I don't see that in implosive potential. They feel like they have a very high floor is what I'm getting at. Like when I look at the Raptors and the Cavs, those are two teams that stand out where, you know, I could see things going really wrong and maybe Atlanta or Brooklyn, um, even Boston a little bit, even Philly, just because of, you know, does is Harden? He's in great shape, but does he regress? Mm. Is Embiid injured again? Uh, they yeah. are still like kind of shallow a little bit. So I don't see that implosive potential with Cleveland, even though they're you know integrating a very big part of their team. And I think that helps them for the regular season specifically. You you made a great point about the playoffs. It's when we're going through standings predictions, we're not necessarily saying like, oh, this team is going to come out of the East. I don't think there's a chance by the end of the year we say, yeah, Cleveland's one of the three or four most likely teams to come out of the conference. It's possible. I don't know yeah. that I'd predict it right now, but they do feel like they're set up for, even if we don't see their peak this year, that they're set up to be really good during the regular season. Yeah, yeah. They, they are probably going to fail along the way. Uh, it, it's probably going to come in the playoffs. There, there, there's a lot of guys that need to learn what that experience is like. But again, because, to circle back to the beginning, because you don't know what your window is, making the move for Donovan Mitchell and giving yourself your best chance now and a, a, a situation where when they lose in the playoffs, it's going to be because of things that Darius Garland is going to learn from it and make adjustments to. And it's going to be because of the growth that is still ahead of them. And I think when you battle test these guys early on and you give them this experience and you allow them to go through these issues and, and these setbacks together, it's going to give them the best chance to be competitive in the near future, because the long-term future is not guaranteed in any way, shape or form in the NBA. That's, that's just reality. So uh, I think it, it's really, really exciting to see what they've put together. And the only limitation is how good these guys are. And, and honestly, if we want to distill it even further down, it's how good Evan Mobley is this season. Justin, as usual, this was great. And you were way too generous with your time for anyone who skipped the intro. Are you able to just tell our listeners where they can find you and all the great work that you do? Absolutely. You can find the Chase Down podcast wherever you got this podcast. Uh, we're on the Cavs YouTube channel as well as, every, as well as every podcast app. You can also find me on Twitter at Cavs Anada. You can also find the podcast at, at Chase Down Pod. I will never pronounce your Twitter handle correctly. It's like a tongue twister for me. I don't it's understand. Canada, that. man. It's Canada. It's Cavs in Canada. Get it together. Get Cavs in Canada. I can't, I can't do it. I try. I <laughs> me. Um, thank you so much for doing this. And as you know by now, like I will be sliding into your DMs again in the future. Anytime, baby. Anytime.